And we're back with another Pico CTF challenge, a forensics challenge, Shark on Wire 2. Description, we found this packet capture, and we're given a download link, recover the flag that was pilfered from the network. I've already gone ahead and downloaded it here. I'm gonna open up Wireshark. If you're not familiar with Wireshark, I have an earlier video where I talk all about how to view this. I know it can be overwhelming for somebody new. I'll include a link above. And as with every packet capture we look at, I'm going to start with statistics, but before I do, uh, I want to discuss the general philosophy I think you should have for CTFs. I've gotten some comments that are like, fair play to you, I, I've never even heard this language, or wow, that's amazing that you found that, and uh, I'm very flattered by people saying that and, and thinking that I'm some savant, but really, uh, a lot of these, especially the CTF problems that are, are kind of bullshit, in my opinion, I, I look at them, maybe there's something for me to learn that I, I don't immediately know, I spend some time on it, and then if I'm not making progress, I look at the solution. And, and then I see, you know, was this a good problem? Did it teach me something? Or was it kind of ridiculous? Like this one I'm gonna show you, I think is a, a bad problem. So I just wanna emphasize, if you're watching these, I've got about 50 of these videos, and I go through these things pretty methodically and pretty quickly, but I've already looked at it. I already know the solution. And uh, sometimes in real life, this is what happens. And I just blitz right through these, but uh, you're, you're just like me. So approach it that way. Don't worry, don't feel stupid. This is okay. All right, so let's look at statistics. And I like to look at capture file properties to start and just get a sense of what we're looking at. So we're looking at about 19 minutes of traffic, 1300 packets and about nine kilobytes. So again, this is not too big. This is something we can poke and prod uh, manually without any real efforts. Let's also look at the conversations that we have. And we can see we have quite a few more conversations than we've had in the past. We've got 35 IPv4, and it looks like a handful of conversations are taking up the bulk of uh, the packets. We've got a very little bit of IPv6, and then we have a ton of UDP. And uh, I want to talk about what a conversation is. It is the same as a stream. So when we view streams in a minute, like TCP streams, UDP streams, we're looking at what Wireshark calls a conversation here. And a conversation, it, it's a little bit of a weird idea because um, UDP is a connectionless protocol meaning everything is just a, a one-off. So how does uh, a one-off that, that may or may not be delivered versus TCP, which ensures that every pack is delivered. And there are use cases where UDP is really good. For example, streaming video or something like that. Uh, you don't necessarily need to get every piece of someone's live stream and you don't want to stop if a packet gets lost you kind of just want to continue so you don't fall behind, you don't start lagging. It's the same with video games. Video games use UDP. Whereas things like if you were transferring uh, an email, your resume, something like that, you want to make sure that every packet gets there so you'd use TCP. So what is a UDP stream? Well, it's the combination of an IP, a port, and then another IP that you're conversing with, and another port. So as we go down here, we can see this is dot one talking over port 888 to dot two, which is listening on 5000. And they're, they're talking both ways from A to B and B to A. So a new conversation occurs when we uh, change IPB. IPB now is dot seven, so this is a new conversation. But one of the things we see that's really interesting in here is most of these new conversations are the result of a change in the IP. So this was dot six, now it's dot one, now it's dot two that dot 11 is talking to. When we go down, what we're gonna see is dot 66 talks to dot one over port 5000. It also talks to dot one over port 5112, 5105. It does this a lot. It's switching between ports a lot and it's not sending many packets. It sends one, two, one, 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 one. This is kind of unusual behavior. We don't really see this with any other connection that we see in here. 
Uh, I think at the very bottom, you might see one that's kind of changing. So this uh, 2.1 is going to 250. It's always going to port 1900, but it's changing the port. All right, so that's, that's a little bit weird. So let's file that away as something perhaps meaningful. And let's look at the protocol hierarchy, which is the last of the statistical things that I think are just good to kind of get a basis for what we're looking at. So I like to collapse things down. That's the fastest way I've found to go through things. And we can see not much of this link layer discovery protocol, not much IPv6, a ton of IPv4, and a bunch of ARP. And then when we look at the IPv4, there's a little bit of TCP, 10% of the packets, there's a ton of UDP. All right, so let's start. We've never looked at ARP. Uh, I'd like to quickly look at ARP and explain what it is, and then we'll move on. ARP's a very simple protocol. It's the address resolution protocol. And what it's doing is someone is interested in finding out who has an IP. They want to know the MAC, the media access control. That's just, uh, it's a special value that's like, think of it like your, your home address. It is the hardware's name. And so in this case, we've got a guy who's asking who has the IP 10.0.0.11. Please tell 10.0.0.5. So it wants you to tell it your special hardware ID. And we can see there's a bunch of this happening. And when we look at ARP, it's really, it's a very simple protocol. So is it possible for something to be sent across? Absolutely. Is it likely? No, and it's not where I'm going to start. Instead, where I'm going to start is, I'm going to start with TCP streams. So TCP and UDP, as we discussed, are the two primary ways that things are going to be carried across the wire. And so we'll start by looking at the streams. And this is tantalizing. It looks like it could be some kind of flag or something, but it's not immediately obvious what's going on here. And so I'll continue on. I'm just going down here to this stream number and we can see there's only one TCP stream. Okay, so we'll move on to looking at UDP. We'll start with the first stream and we'll follow it. And we can see some kind of protocol, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe SMB or uh, some kind of file share. Same thing, same thing. I I'm just going through quickly to see if anything really stands out. Like this Pico Pico Pico, it kind of stands out, but I don't see anything immediately here that indicates what's going on. Uh, we have what looks like maybe a misformed flag Maybe if we put in Pico CTF, if we put in the, the format that was expected, maybe it would take this. So if we added Pico CTF, but that's not it. Okay, so let's, let's continue along. Not a flag, okay. We've got another one that kind of looks broken or malformed. We'll try fixing it and we'll see if that ends up being the flag. No, sorry. Continuing through our streams, taking a look. We've got garbage. Pico CTF sure is fun, sure is fun, sure is fun. Really want to find some flags. We've got another protocol that looks legit. C T F. So maybe this is going to be spread out over multiple uh, packages or packets, excuse me. We'll see if we get something there. More garbage, another protocol, bunch of A's, some kind of protocol, garbage, protocol, an underscore. Maybe this is part of those packages. We've got 36, again, maybe part of that CTF an underscore 36, a curly to end, that's looking kind of suspicious. Maybe, maybe we are spelling it out of multiple packets, a bunch of Z's, a bunch of A's, another protocol, 
get a start. Okay, that also looks very interesting. So maybe remember we were talking about the packets that are going across the wire that are individually spelling out what's going on. So maybe this is saying start. And then after that, we look for all the other stuff, a bunch of A's, more A's, going through this kind of fast now, a bunch more A's, yep, B, so kind of stands out, don't know what to make of it yet, protocol, more A's, more B's, and those B's really stand out. So maybe look at those. End, okay, so start and then end. That seems like it may be signaling something to us. All right, and now we've exhausted everything that we have. So let's, let's begin with start because that seemed interesting. So we're gonna say UDP contains Start. Oops, I can't spell today. UDP. All right, so we can see that this dot sixty six address is talking to dot one over port five thousand, and it sends the message start. So I guess let's start by filtering on dot sixty six, and let's see what else it sent to us over time. And we can see it's just sent a bunch of A's. When we look at this uh, as a conversation, follow as UDP stream, uh, it didn't, hmm, it didn't quite work. Not sure why. Oh, because these are individual, I see, I see. These are individual streams because the port is changing. Now let's take a look and let's see, we're gonna watch the bytes at the bottom and we're gonna see if anything else is changing. So I see this portion seems to change and this portion. Let's try to find out what those map to in the fields by clicking on them. So we, we click on them and we can see that's the checksum that's changing. The checksum is a way to validate that the, the packet is legit. So we would expect for any change, the checksum is going to change. It's like, uh, I don't know, a manifest is a way to look at it. Like if you got something from the post office and you wanted to know, does this have all the contents, you would look at the manifest and you would say, oh, well, this is, this has uh, a box of Skittles, uh, a bag of Oreos, whatever. And if something was missing, then you'd know that this had been tampered with or broken somehow. All right, so that one's changing and it's the checksum. So that's, that's not really interesting. But this other value is also changing. And it's the only thing that's changing. And it's the UDP port. And you'll notice it seems to always be 5,000, but all the other digits change. So, and here, here is the crazy jump in logic that I didn't get. I had to look at the solution for this. I saw this, but I was like, you know, okay, who cares? If you look at these three digits, that falls in the range of ASCII. So 112, if we were to go to Chrome and look up an ASCII table, what is 112 in decimal? Let me make this a little larger for you. 112 is P, and we're looking for a flag that starts with Pico. So what is I? I is 105. Well, again, removing that five, now we have 105 I. Is this C, is 99 C? It is. All right, so let's do this in a smarter way than going through manually or, or copying and pasting everything out. And let's open up T Shark, Terminal Shark, which I've gone into using quite a bit in earlier videos and we'll go into here. I'll link those earlier videos, but we're going to pass in this packet capture, which is capture.pcap. We're going to apply the same filter that we currently have. 
And what we're doing here is I just don't want to go through this manually. I want to do this on the command line programmatically. I want to pull out all these values that we think are ASCII. And so I'll start there. And what we can see is we have the packets that we expect it to have. Uh, we can verify by there are 34 displayed. We could do probably a word count minus L for lines. So number of lines, 34. All right, so we're good so far. So I want to extract a field with minus E. And I'm interested in this source port. And Wireshark is really helpful in that it'll tell you how to address each one of these uh, fields. So this is UDP.source port. And I learned that just by clicking down here. And you can see this value changes, UDP.source port. So we'll put that in. And then additionally, it would fail if we just clicked right now. Because we need to tell it, how do we want to receive this information? Do we want to do it? as uh, elastic format? Do we want to do it as fields, which is raw, JSON, uh, some other format I'm not familiar with? Well, we're interested in raw. We don't want any other things added to it. So that looks good. But I still, I'm lazy, and I don't want to have to go through and remove each one of these fives. So let's pipe this to cut. We, we want to cut characters and we want to remove everything before the second character. So two minus is the syntax for that. And now we have our 112, 105, 99. That's good, but I, I'd like it to be a single line. So let's also do a translate and we're gonna translate from the new line character to space. And now we can see we have a, a single line of all our characters, which I'm going to copy. And I'm going to bring over to an ASCII calculator. Let's see. Uh, converter is what I should have called it, an ASCII converter. And what this is going to do is when I put something in, in decimal here, it's going to give me the representation in binary, hex, ASCII, base64, etc. So there we go. Let's, let's eliminate just a little bit of our trash here. We've got this leading zero. And we have PicoCTF uh, pillage data via stego. Uh, steganography is what they're referring to. And I, I don't even believe that's really steganography, but OK. So let's go ahead and submit this. And then let's talk about why I think this was kind of a, a bullshit challenge. Uh, it's very difficult to find exactly where you're supposed to be looking. You know, you might see this start, and the start makes a lot of sense. There's also an end. The end is not part of this conversation. So this is going out to 10.0.0.66. If we look at UDP contains end, you'll see this is coming from dot uh, 80 so it's not even coming from the same IP so it, it's very hard to figure out you know what's what's legit and what's not because uh, we could just as easily have sent this stuff all via ARP you know so maybe a series of ARP requests that are just changing the IP you know either tell or who has you know so it's not obvious you can make this arbitrarily hard by doing random bullshit and um, it's just kind of disappointing and frustrating so anyway my my advice stays the same try to learn first try to do it yourself and then if you're getting frustrated look at the solution because you may find it's not in your opinion a very good problem and so you don't want to invest a ton of time but there are really good CTF problems that will force you to think differently and will put you in different scenarios. And it's worth investing a little bit of time first before you look at the solution. Anyway, hopefully that was helpful to you. If it was, you can help me out by liking, subscribing, uh, commenting, all those YouTube algorithm things help me out a lot. Thanks. Bye.